doctor says to me, he says, uh, well, what do you get out of playing in a brass band, Mr. A? I says, well, I says, uh, when I put the music up to play, I says, I play it to the best of my ability. I says, I put everything on one side, I says, I even forget everything. I says, I even forget I'm married. <laughs> of the industrial north it's not uncommon to have a euphonium in the bedroom or a trombone in the kitchen you grow up learning how to live with them this is brass band country To the uninitiated, brass bands are at best a joke, at worst a pain in the ear. But in the industrial towns and villages of Lancashire and Yorkshire, banding, as it's known, is a way of life. The popular notion of a brass band musician is of a middle-aged man who votes labour, drinks pints of bitter, beats his wife and breeds greyhounds. Like most popular notions, it doesn't stand up to close scrutiny. It is generally true that brass bands draw their players from industry, from the mills and from the mines. But that having been said, the only other common denominator among brass bandsmen is an all-consuming passion for their hobby. It's a passion best understood by the many long-suffering North Country wives who have learned to sit alone in the evenings while their husbands conduct a love affair with a musical instrument. Just, just pull it back on the last triplet, but the semi break you know, we've tied it up down here, haven't we, to take all the sustainer. Hold it right through, please, to the end of the bar. All right. And just listen. Brass bands were born in settings like this more than a century ago. Here was created a sound which was a perfect echo of its surroundings, muscular music with hair on its chest. Rhythm. 
Dum, 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 A century ago, the bosses encouraged bands to be formed because it seemed to keep the workers happy. It proved to be an inspired piece of labour relations, albeit accidental. If he works something manually, even in the weaving shed or wherever he works, his fingers are rough. He can't play a violin. He can't play a piano correctly. But his lip is a delicate point, And he can play a wind instrument, a flute or a brass instrument or anything. He can play that correctly or he can sing. But he can't play anything what's got delicate touch where the thing is required. I heard my first brass band as a child in a Yorkshire pit village. Today, the noise of sounding brass stirs images of those lost days. Miners, but wash away the coal dust and you might just find the best trombone player in England. The North Country is changing, the mines are closing, village life disappearing. Much of what seemed so permanent when I was a child is nowadays a withered relic of another, less enlightened age. The first time I got my instrument was when my father had asked for one of a gentleman who lived close on. So I went the following night and picked the instrument up, which was a B-flat baritone, an old brass one, bulged, battered, and green with the slats of water, as we say in Yorkshire. In other words, the spit from the mouthpiece. I would take this instrument home proudly, and that was it, I got an instrument. Instruments get more expensive every year. In consequence, the plight of brass bands, particularly the smaller ones, becomes increasingly desperate. For some bands, a new trombone can cause an acute financial crisis. 
Mm, for instance, the trombone today costs 80 pounds, five shillings. That's a matter of six years ago, and this instrument only cost 60 pounds. The cornet, which is the most popular instrument for youngsters to start their career on, and also they need more of these in the brass band, this costs 69 pounds. The euphonium, this goes up to 225 pounds. And of course, when we come to the double bass, we have a price of 327 pounds. And a full set of brass band instruments today is in the region of 4,000 pounds. To the majority of brass bands, 4,000 pounds for a new set of instruments is an impossible dream. Those are the bands that exist without financial backing from industry and rely on public goodwill. Village bands. Once, every village had at least one. Today, those that survive do so only by persuading the villagers that banding is a tradition worth paying for. This village, Scapegoat Hill near Huddersfield, has its own band. It's broke and a thousand pounds in debt. To repay the debt, it's offered its band room for sale. Anybody want a band room in the middle of nowhere? I think we've served the village all these year years, and I think we ought to do one serve in the village. But whatever there is up, um, any, any colonizations out like that, or any public uh, demonstrations, we ought to be there to lead the procession, lead whatever it goes in the village. And, and if, if the scapegoat they'll band, had disbanded, there'd be nothing in the village. And the brass band has been a part of this village for 116 years. Oh, when you've been brought up at the band, I've you been, want to support I've that band. 40, I've done 49 years this year band, and I didn't want it to break up, though it's five years since I've given up, retired. But when, when, they, when they wanted some players, I volunteered to come back and play. And I'm, I'm hoping they won't play. But well, we've got all these young boys um, established. And then when they, when they got them established, I can retire gleefully. The children inherit the tradition, but do they care? The popular belief is that they don't, that nowadays they prefer a guitar to a cornet. But there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Indeed, in Yorkshire today, more children than ever are learning to play brass music. Because you're not remembering to use your lips, you know, you've been taught. Have your lips like a piece of elastic, stretching all the time. Same note.
will try hymn number four. When you come to the crescendo bars, let the breath flow onto the notes and then back again on the diminuendo. You keep your fingertips on the keys there. Now, shall we try this tune? The court, please. <laughs> Now, we have some wrong notes here. Michael, you are not putting that slide in the right position. And you, Stephen, you're putting wrong fingers down. Don't do that, because you'll never get into the senior band if you do. Let's try that chord once more. Let's have some right notes. <laughs> When I was a little lad, when, when, the, when bands used to come round the district at Sunday school festivals, they used to go in a field at night and they played in a ring in those days, conductor in the middle. They no music stands, they didn't bring them, and uh, they used to ask some old little lads to hold them. The copies, and of course we used to hold them, put part of it under his chin and other with his thumbs at the bottom, and occasionally they'd say, take your thumb or else your finger away, lad, I can't see them. And, and of course, uh, I used to know some tunes and keep popping in, and. And uh, that's how I sort of got my interest for a starter. The first time I ever felt as though I'd like to play a brass instrument was Whitsuntide, when all the denominations, namely Methodist, Baptist Church of England, what have you, had the procession of witness. And we as scholars followed behind the band. And it was the sound of the band on a bright May day, invariably. I thought to myself, when I'm be told that I like to play in a band, I like to play instrument. Well, when my mother was alive, every time she had a brass band, she broke out in tears. And that was a, it was a way of expressing herself, because she enjoyed it. Conquering heroes on their lap of honor. Trophies held tenderly and proudly like newborn babies. Another silver plated pot for the trophy cupboard. Banding isn't simply a question of learning an instrument and going out for a jolly good blow with the lads. It's about playing better than your neighbor. And what could be more important than that? For all its amateur status, it's a fiercely competitive business. Brass bands are arranged in four divisions a Super League at the top, a fourth division for the scrubbers. Relegation and promotion depends on how bands make out in competitions. The success of a band, and whether it be right or be it wrong, the success of a band depends on how successful it is at a contest. And uh, these contests are a little bit cutthroat. I don't like the atmosphere, personally, of a, of a brass band contest. I don't like it. But uh, 
there if you want to be a successful band then you have to go in for these contests and you have to win them. Ted Buttress, Secretary of the Council of Brass Band Associations. Uh, bands uh, probably take them even more seriously today than they did some years ago because of course they have found that uh, success in competitions uh, improves their status both musically and financially so far as engagements are concerned. In this country now we have over 200 contests promoted every year. In the majority of promotions, the, the bands in each grade have to play a set test piece. And they take this very, very seriously indeed. In fact, they are prepared to rehearse five and six evenings each week before the actual contest takes place. The months of preparation end in a bus trip to Sheffield or Leeds or Manchester or any town that stages competitions. On the surface, these trips look like holiday jaunts with the wife and kids along for the ride. Just the odd hint of tension to illustrate the serious business ahead. The ifs and buts of an outing like this are always the same. If the band wins a prize, then it will all seem worthwhile. But if it doesn't, then there's always the next one. And in any case, win or lose, there'll be hangovers in the morning.
Bloody hell, who's this lot? Looks like Ed Edger. Bellevue, Manchester, renowned as a place of pleasure, but also a shrine to the brass band movement. It's here, among the flippancies of fun fairs, the bands meet in deadly earnest for their most important competition. Here at Bellevue is the office of the brass band registrar. His job is to prevent cheating in competitions, to stop the best players donning false beards and freelancing amongst the bands. The registry, of course, now tries to bring law and order to the brass band world. And I would like to show you the, uh, the files that we have here in the registry for the bands and the bands. And here we have the individual bands. We've over 600 registered here. And here we have the individual cards where the life of a bandsman is shown from the day he joins the band until he decides to uh, leave it. We've over 18,000 cards there. The reason for all this, of course, is to uh, help the contest authorities so that when, uh, when there is a contest and they present the contest sheet to the committee, along with the registration card, which in includes the signature and the number, then it can be compared with the sheet and the contest authorities know whether he's a genuine registered player. From the bond's point of view, there can be little doubt that the adjudicator is the most important person at the contest. Because, of course, the fate of the bonds taking part depends entirely upon his decision. There are bonds, usually the losers, who suggest that the adjudicator uh, is not very good and, in many cases, biased against their particular bond. This, of course, is absolute nonsense and rubbish. Extreme precautions are taken to ensure that the adjudicator arrives untarnished by possible temptation. Any bandsman hoping to influence his decision with a nod or a wink would have to be a very early riser, because traditionally the adjudicator is smuggled in with the cleaning women. This, after all, is a serious business, worthy of ritual and po-faced solemnity. Marched under escort to the main hall, the adjudicator is placed in his box. Again, the precautions taken to ensure his anonymity would do credit to the Secret Service. The box is windowless. The doors are locked. They'll be opened in six hours' time after the adjudicator has gone through the refined torture of listening to the same piece of music played by 12 different bands. His isolation is complete. Now that the adjudicator is safely locked away, we can now get on with the most important part of the agenda, and that is the draw for the order of play. Before the contest begins, each bandsman is scrutinized. His card is stamped, his signature checked against the registrar's files. These files contain every detail of the bandsman and his career. They omit only his fingerprints and the location of birthmarks. This ponderous business of checking identity is to prevent a band slipping in an outsider to better its chances of success. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> the
The bandsmen surface from their underground waiting rooms. The build-up and the palaver has reached its climax. In his box, the adjudicator prepares for the bands he can hear but cannot see. Let battle commence. See that the adjudicator and the supervision committee have arriving with the results. Released from six hours of solitary confinement, the adjudicator can be forgiven his stumble as he leaves his prison. But the ordeal is not yet over. Uh, before opening the envelopes and, uh, and announcing the results to you. I wish to introduce the adjudicator, Mr. Frank Wright, MBE, a member of the Corporation of Trinity College of Music. He was awarded a, an honorary fellowship there in 1966 in company with Sir Malcolm Sargent and Eugenie uh, Menihin. It is now, now my duty to announce the winners for the second and first sections. The winners of the second section championship who will receive the National Colbert Challenge Trophy. Shrouded by secrecy and wrapped in mystique, one might imagine that the adjudicator's notes contain the key to great riches. Not a bit of it. The band he has picked as the champion will earn a cash prize of 30 pounds. For fourth place, you get a fiver. The financial prizes for success in the brass band world are really not worth fighting about. But the bands do fight with vigour and a cool disregard for fair play. The name of the game is to win, and one way you win is by pinching good players from other bands. The polite term is poaching. I have my views on this, strongly. And the views are this, that uh, it's the method of approach from bands to players in other bands trying to coax them away. They may meet a player on the street. They may go to his home. They may meet him at a contest. And they put uh, sweet things in his ears. We have cases where a player, he gets some little niggling thing on his mind, uh, may have been upset with another member of the band, and uh, it grows into a big haystack when the other band are talking to him. Well, I should think they want more money for the job. They don't get any year, so they go yeah. where they can get a few. Yes, pounds. but I don't know about the money. I've no proof about that. But, as I say, if he has a, a, a little thing that's niggling him, perhaps he's in a section of his own band whereby he thinks, oh, I shall never be the soloist in that section whilst that man's there. These other bands lose a player. Naturally, they've got to find one from somewhere else. That's right. So they don't want to bother with learners. So we don't know what to do. We don't like to lose any player here because 
it takes a number of years to train a young person to play. There are bands that remain aloof from the bickering, the elite, the glamour bands. If brass bands were football teams, Black Dyke Mills would be Manchester United. There's only one band as far as anybody who lives around here is concerned, that is Black Dyke. Uh, anybody who lives in Lancashire, of course, they might say that they want to join Fair Aviation or, or Fordens, but as far as we're concerned, and for quite a, a distance from Bradford, it's, it's all Black Dyke. <laughs> We tend to think more in terms of music making and going out and playing to the public. We give something like 50 or 60 concerts a year, in, uh, many of them in quite, quite important concert halls. We usually have packed houses. Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you with very, very great pleasure the internationally famous Black Dyke Mills Band. Black Dyke Mills is a works band, the proud property of John Foster and Sons, cloth manufacturers of Queensbury. The bandsmen have no financial worries. They're found jobs in the factory. They receive fees for being a member of the band. Cynics suggest that Black Dyke Mills gets the best players because it can afford them. But perhaps there's another reason. The name Black Dyke in the band world acts as a, a kind of magnet. There must be many, many players who would dearly like to think that someday they are going to play with Black Dyke, or some other such band. This, is, this doesn't just apply to Black Dyke, but possibly more to Black Dyke than most, because it's such an old established name, and everyone uh, almost has heard of Black Dyke Mills Band. The ambition of every young boy is to get in Black Dyke, of course. Mm -hmm. When I first started playing, father told me to play, and uh, with him being in the banding world, went to contests with him, Went to concerts, and every time you hear Black Dyke, give you a thrill. And that just set my ambition to be a member of Black Dyke Band. I heard Black Dyke about 18 years ago in Ashington. And uh, since then, you know, it's uh, been an ambition. You know, it was the first really first class band I'd ever heard. And that was it. You know, it left an impression on me. And here I am. <laughs> It's generally true that the most successful brass bands are made successful by the patronage of industry, but there are exceptions. The most famous is the Brighouse and Rastrick band, which relies on public support for its finance and today rejoices in the resounding title of Brass Band Champion of Great Britain. 
Even though both of you are amateurs running an amateur organization, don't you both think of yourself as being professionals running a professional organization? Oh, yes, yes. I, I think, although it, it is purely amateur, I think we've got to look on it as, as something professional. Nowadays, a top band like Brighouse is as much at home in a recording right studio as it is in a concert feet. hall. Machine is running. We're ready now, gentlemen. North Country Fantasy, take five. The gloss of the big names of the brass band world is apparent in any record shop. Music, which once belonged exclusively to the industrial north, is now available to anyone with a couple of quid to spare. To someone breast fed on brass bands, the quality of bands like Brighouse and Black Dyke and their commercial exploitation is light years removed from the echo of childhood memories. village band, slightly tatty but full of vigour, that shows the brass band in its proper position in northern life. All the bandsmen ten feet tall, bouncing their music off the rooftops like hailstones, making dogs howl and small children scamper like field mice. for more than a hundred years. It will last much longer, because, as any brass bandsman will tell you, there's more to it than simply making music. Well, there's that good comradeship about brass, brass band. He, he, wherever you are, if you know you're in a band and there's somebody else there, they say, oh, I heard you so-and-so. And if you go away, say you go for holiday, and uh, they, they say, oh, are you in a band? Yes. Oh, well, come up to our rehearsals if you want to blow, and a man will put his instrument down and let you... A player there, they're very pleased to admit you to the ranks. Banding, you know, it's uh, someone who gets in your blood, it's the same as working, you know. It's... If you have music in here, some people have more music than others, in their body, in the soul, whatever you get to call it, and it has to come out, you try and express yourself. 